Morning, everyone. Um, you know, I've been uh, fighting this battle in healthcare for about 12, 15 years now. And, um, you know, I've started to want to start a club uh, that, that we're calling the Tilted Windmill Society, which is for those of us with enough scars about trying to change something that no one believes can or will be changed. Um, that we're in the fight. And I wanted to talk today about uh, a way of maybe integrating some of the ideas here a little bit, not so much uh, the work we're doing, though I think it connects. But I first want to go back and uh, set the tone a little bit because, you know, we're at this big data conference, and the goal here is to figure out how we're going to make a big difference. And I've been working in data for a long time, and I want to talk a little bit about some of the limitations of data, and, and maybe we should be imposing a little realism or a little caution in the way we think about the solution coming out of this. So I'm going to do about 12 years worth of research in six slides really quickly, see if I can convey this. This is a paper um, that came out from a friend of mine at Hopkins that showed that uh, Celebrex made uh, mice live longer. And uh, based on this paper, I treated my brother with this drug. And this is classic excellent discovery. It's, it's when you do, you treat in an, an idealized blinded experiment an animal and you come up with an answer and, and the animal lives longer and you would get excited and we want to translate that. Alex immediately invests in my company. He's going to build a thing out. We're going to make money. Dot bio. So $25 million, 25,000 mice later, um, this is a summary of every preclinical study I attempted to replicate in the goal to treat my brother with a drug. On the left is every published study that led to human clinical trials with a total number of mice of 417. On the right is my replications of every one of those studies with a total number of mice of 857. I could not replicate a single result that led to human studies, including two trials that killed patients faster. So we're not just talking about $200 million worth of lost research. We're talking about people dying because the data, the excellent research that we worked off of, turned out not to be true. Now, why it was not true is a complicated, long discussion. You can read the papers and all that kind of stuff. There's a lot of people have talked about this. Two consequences of this I want to point out. One is Nature wrote a very big editorial about this paper saying that maybe this should call into question the way we do research and nothing changed. Now, this is a big deal. This wasn't small. But we still do it this way. We still test drugs in human beings that never really worked in the original baseline experiments. And it's not just our results that prove this. This is a data from uh, Bayer that analyzed all of the results that led to oncology. 80% couldn't be replicated, 40% by Amgen. Basically, all of us are making economic decisions on bad data. This is not a problem with analysis. This is not a problem with the, the information. It's just bad data. And, and, you know, that's kind of a depressing summary since my goal was to save my brother's life of seven or eight years worth of research and all of that money. I wasn't trying to do this. I was trying to find something that worked. We just did the comp experiments very comprehensively and well. So the next stage of data that I want to talk about, and I'm going to go through discovery, clinical research, care, take these all apart a little bit, is clinical research. And, and you know, this is a study that, that you know, I've talked about a lot. Uh, it, this is a, a, of lithium and its potential benefit in ALS as a treatment. And what they did is they did a good, well-designed clinical research study with a treatment and a control group, and they built their grids of data with the measurements that are meaningful and, 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 com and contain the components that, that, that relate to the disease. And they got a result like the line I showed you before, where the patients in the blue line did better than the patients on the red line. And of course, if you're an ALS patient, you want to take the drug that puts you on the blue line, so you do. And lots of patients did. And I said I wouldn't talk about patients like me, but here's one minute. We showed that in the real world, when real patients, not in a trial, not with the biases or the all issues of research, took this drug, they didn't get any better. In fact, they did exactly as expected. And you can see our power and our ability. So we refuted this test. And I think you know, that was a significant finding. It was the first time anyone ever refuted a result in the real world observationally by collecting the kind of data that Alex mentioned in his talk about you know, the phenomic outcomes of the, of the treatment. Um, and we published this. But I think what's also interesting is that we're not the only ones that have had trouble refuting stuff. This is John Ioannidis, who's got much significant amount of data on how unreproducible the clinical research is. So again, is the problem the analysis? Is the problem the connection to the data? 
The reality is, is that based on the best, this is the best that we have. It just turns out not to be that accurate. So the third thing, now that we've gone through discovery and clinical research, is clinical care, which is to be evidence-based. And this is one of my favorite papers of all time. I suggest you read it all. It's, a, it's an article in the BMJ that evaluates, based on clinical evidence, whether a doctor should suggest that a patient use a parachute when they jump out of an airplane. Now, it turns out you can't, according to the rules of medical evidence, make that suggestion. And so, you know, and what this is kind of funny, there's a couple components that are worth talking about here. So one is obviously you should use parachutes when you jump out of airplanes because you're unlikely to die. Um, my favorite counters to this, by the way, there's 54 articles in the series, is one that mentions, well, no, they did the experiment. They threw sheep out first. And of course, as we established back in Discovery, animal experiments don't translate to humans. But I also find really amusing about this is, you know, Parachutes had a very serious adverse event rate initially, 1%, and it was, you know, that really was a bad adverse event rate, and yet it's zero now, and yet we've somehow done, you know, as we all saw someone drum for 24 miles a couple days ago, um, you know, we can do amazing things now, and we never did a single double-blind placebo-controlled study, so somehow we learned how to take the adverse event rate from 1% to, cl to close to zero, you know, one in a 10 million or so. Um, and, and we did so without doing a single formal research study. And I find that, that interesting and, and, worth, um, and, and worth thinking about. Um, but I also want to note that, that it isn't just whether the evidence is there or not. This is uh, my favorite takedown of the thing. This is from the Institute of Medicine. Um, and and uh, this is an old study. It's 1999. And it showed that there's roughly 98,000 preventable medical errors that cause deaths in the United States uh, per year, which if you look at the CDC, this is about 2005 data, would make medical errors the sixth leading cause of death. Now, you know, accidents are just above that. Diabetes is below that. So, I mean, even if we have the evidence, we're so badly delivering it that the system isn't working well. Now, I, 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 Tina mentioned a lot about claims data, which I think we're beginning to make significant information out of in her talk. And I think there's a massive amount of information or possibilities in there. Um, but I, 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 wrote the, I put the title patient value on here. This is a note about my brother. Because I wanted to really ask the question, does any value to my brother, is it reflected in this note? This is a good note, right, Tina? This is about as good as they get, right? They don't, they don't get much more accurate than that. So, so if, is, there, is there value about my brother? Because this is all the medical system knows that it did for him. Now, it spent hundreds of thousands of dollars trying to save his life and do things. And it doesn't know whether it did any good. And, and, I, and I struggle with that as a question. Uh, and so we built this website to sort of capture the, the, the detailed medical phenomics that, that Alex mentioned that, that, that contain in my brother's here the stem cell transplant that he had, the, the, the medical errors that he had in the hospitals, the, the, the gaps in care, the value and outcome. So it is possible to think about building systems like this, um, but we don't do it. And the question is why? I mean, I, I think that's the real question. So. Um, when, when I first did that animal work and we were unable to replicate anything, we, we held a meeting in our, in our company in 2005 and we said, what are we going to do? We've just tested every drug that everyone has imagined in the field. None of them are working. We need to cure this disease. The literature is a lie. And we actually had a meeting where we said, you know, I think it will be cheaper to recreate the molecular basis of ALS, to redo every experiment than to separate the wheat from the chaff. If, if, if the wheat has fallen down, if it's unorganized, if there's no way to harvest it, if, if you can't separate the two components because we don't know what is real and what is not real in our data, maybe what we should think about is starting from scratch. Maybe we should just say that everything we know today, if we designed the experiment correctly, will be so worthless that we should stop wasting time on it any longer. That we should begin to ask the question, what are we really doing in healthcare? Separating wheat from chaff is not an easy thing to do. You have to know what's real and what's not real. And you have to line things up. And if you really want to harvest wheat well, you have to prune the weeds, fertilize the, the fields, 
and, and then harvest it at the right moment in time. And that is what we don't do in medicine. We let everything just lie fallow and then try and come in with our supercomputers and pick it up and pretend that we will extract bread from straw. And I don't think we can. So I asked the question, what is health? Do we know what health is? Health is a vector that starts at your birth and you go through your life. And, at the, and through your life, this is, call it the mobility vector, how quickly you can move. And you can see my two-year-old right here at the beginning of the line, though he's getting pretty damn quick and almost out of the crib. And then the four-year-old about halfway up. And then my 12-year-old that just joined the swim team. And then myself at the declining side of this line. And my father at age 75 on the more declining side of this line. And our objective is to make this move to the right as much as possible so that we have health. And yet, we talk about Bolt, or we talk about Michael Phelps as the idealized health mobility vectors, maybe, speed, water, speed in air, speed in walking. Um, but we don't know what health really means. We don't know what mobility means for any of us because we don't measure it. Well-being is another important health vector, vector itself. We don't know what well-being is. Here's my, you know, my, my happy childhood, my terrible experience in middle school, going to college, having kids, then my you know, well-being crashed. If any of you with children know, that's really low. According to the evidence, there actually are some studies that show that well-being goes back again after your children leave the home, almost to the level it would have been if you'd never had them. So that's what health and what hell is it. But we don't know what these vectors are. We don't know the relationship between disease and well-being and disease and mobility. Every one of us studying disease make up our own framework, our own basic understanding of where we're working. They're all isolated incidents, whether it be cancer or diabetes or ALS. We all make up our own framework. There's no common reference because we don't know what these things are. Alex articulated how important it was that we connect genomics and phenomics? The answer is we can't do this in experiments any longer. We have to integrate this into the environment. We have to measure everything. And I will say genomics itself actually is actually not that interesting outside of cancer. I'm interested in the state of the machine. What is the state of your immune system, the state of your stress response, the state of the endocrine systems that are controlling your mental health and your and, and all of the components of your body. We don't know what these are. We use the same 25 blood tests we used 60 years ago with a couple of cute additions outside of cancer where we made significant advances. But if you want to measure the state of the machine, you have to give that information back. But it's a new experiment. There are no systems to convey this data into the clinical environment. And when we do this well, if we measure all of these things, and we think about what health itself is, and we have these vectors these vectors of phenomic change, we can make predictions that computers will help us make understand the treatment. That's what foundation is. It's a beautiful business. It's the first of, first of its kind, I think, something that's really beginning to say, I can integrate 400 variables that have, granted, we just demonstrated really weak, weak clinical data supporting it, but at least show of what might be wheat is meaningful to you in a new way. And that prediction allows people to make recommendations to make treatments. I send people there. Anyone you know that has cancer, a solid tumor, should have their done done by Foundation Medicine, period. It's 5,000 bucks, best money you ever spent. Two MRIs, do it. Did I get the price right? I think I get the price right. Okay, do it with your own money if you care about someone. So this is about switching from sort of single disease-based models to longitudinal phenomics where we look at changes in DNA, changes in RNA, changes in protein. And in order to do this, we have to change the way we do research. Discovery, clinical research, care delivery are all broken systems. So throw them out, let's build a new one. Let's integrate these into one system where we collect one set of data that defines health across these variables. And I want to be a part of this experiment. This means that we have to reinvent the way we fund and think about everything. Right now, the researcher is the center, the PI, the index of the world. The dollars flow to him. He designs the experiment. He does the analysis, or she does, and they recruit the patients, and they produce their conclusion. And they're just like Patrick, Moy Patrick Moynihan is a politician. He had a great debate. He said, you, sir, are entitled to your own opinion, but you are not entitled to your own facts. 
Well, clearly, he has never met a clinical researcher because none of us will share our facts. My opinion is what you get. We have to index around the patient. The dollars should flow through the patient, through the research, and then you can have multiple research connected to multiple experiments. And actually, I would say today, you'll hear from us, Personal Genomes Projects, 23andMe Sage, these are all here. These are the first experiments that are indexing around the patient. We all have compromise, we all have cheats. We're all not doing it quite the right way. Sage and PGP are rend, are, are, are the best in here. But, but we need to do this because there isn't a small challenge. I want to switch to a world where we have health, that we solve it effectively. I don't believe there is data in our system today that will get us there. We have to do one experiment, starting now, indexed around the patient, to make this happen. Thank you.